So it's a, a real pleasure and honor to be here. And I'll, I'll be telling you a little bit about our latest human development report. And Ilona has already introduced this notion of human development, which is a, a very simple, basic notion. It's essentially the idea that people should be able to live their lives to their full potential. Very simple idea. But uh, once we recognize the power of this idea, it immediately takes us to a different set of things we should be considering and looking at when we assess progress and uh, assess also the effectiveness of policies. So in our, in our world of development, traditionally, a lot of uh, what people pay attention to has to do with the economy, with jobs, with income, and all of that matters quite a lot, obviously. But that doesn't define fully how a life is lived to, the, to its full potential or not. Things like health, as you know very well, matter. Things like education. And in addition to this broader notion of well-being, another important pillar of the notion of human development that's important for people to live lives to their full potential is the notion of agency, the notion of human agency. The importance of people to make commitments and to live lives, lives according to the commitments they make. Sometimes in ways that may even be harming their well-being as, under, as understood at least by uh, uh, others or by some standards. So these two ideas of a broader notion of well-being and agency, the ability to make commitments and make life uh, and live lives uh, uh, according to these commitments animate this notion of human development. So it's reflected in some metrics like the Human Development Index that Ilona alluded to, which is an indicator uh, that combines income with life expectancy at birth and achievements in education. But we have other indicators as well as part of our battery of human development metrics. For instance, we have a multidimensional poverty index that's a measure of poverty in which income doesn't feature. Imagine this, a measure of poverty in which income doesn't feature. Sometimes we think about poverty as being below or above a certain income threshold. Well, our measure does not inclu include income. Um, and I can give you examples of other of our indices. For instance, we have indices that account for disparities across genders uh, when it comes to achievements in human development. Um, and more recently, we introduced also to Ilona's point about the importance of confronting the challenges such as climate change and others, what we call the Planetary Pressures Adjusted Human Development Index. So this is a broad introduction about human development and over the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, we've been issuing regularly human development report that provides information and updates on these new indices, but also tries to uh, take a topic and uh, understand how a human development approach helps us to understand and inform the topic, the theme uh, in which we, uh, 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 that we want to tackle in, in a specific report. Now, these reports often are about um, portraying how the world is when it comes to human development um, and also to provide ideas, recommendations, suggestions on uh, what can be done to enhance human development. But this report is highly unusual. It's a very different report from the ones in we, that we traditionally have done. Because it's a report that does not have at, as its departure point uh, the aspiration to tell people what to do. It, it, we felt that we, it was actually important to, to listen to what people were saying. To listen what people were saying. And what people were telling us, as you see on the title of the report, was that they were unsettled about their lives. Unsettled about their lives and living in a context of uncertainty. And we have lots of evidence uh, presented in the report that substantiate this idea of unsettledness in people's lives. So you see on, 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 the, on the screen that perceptions of stress have been on an increasing trend regardless of the level of education of people. We found in our report that six out of every seven people around the world, six out of every seven people around the world, feel insecure about many aspects of their life. So a sense, a perception of insecurity. And these perceptions of insecurity have actually been increasing 
in many countries, including in high-income countries and countries with high levels of the Human Development Index. 50% of the population in the world today does not believe that their living standards are better than the living standards of the generation of their parents. This goes against many of the objective measures of well-being that we rely upon, that paint a story of progress. But it's not only about perceptions. If we look at what happened to the Human Development Index, the Global Human Development Index, since we started publishing it in 1990 up, up to, um, let's say, 2019, is a, is a boring story of linear progression, improvement. But in 2020 and 2021, for the first time ever, the Global Human Development Index declined, two years in a row. Not only that, what you see on this screen is the percentage of countries in which there has been a decline in the Human Development Index since uh, 1991 compared to 1990. So you see that every year there are a few countries in which there is a decline in the Human Development Index. One would expect that. Countries go through economic crisis, terms of trade shocks, there are disasters, sometimes linked to natural hazards, civil conflict. But you can see that at most, even around the time of the global financial crisis, 20% of countries show a decline in the Human Development Index. Now look at what happened in 2020 and 2021. You see this big spike in the number of countries that suffered a decline in the Human Development Index. So not only did the global average went, uh, uh, go down, but this decline in the Human Development Index was pervasive across 90% of the countries in the world. And one of the consequences of these perceptions of insecurity and decline over the last two years of objective measures of, of well-being is a deterioration of mental well-being and mental health. So these numbers are before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, started. Uh, you could see that you have, for instance, as many as 300 million people around the world uh, reporting uh, anxiety, and this is most likely underreported, as we all know, uh, and that one in eight people uh, were actually suffering uh, from some sort of mental uh, uh, distress. Um, and we know that since COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, uh, many of these indicators for the places uh, for which we have data have actually deteriorated even further. Now, what can account for this unsettledness in people's lives? And now I turn to the uncertain times. So this is our interpretation in the report as to why are we facing this context of, of unsettledness? And our hypothesis is that we're living through what we call a new uncertainty complex new uncertainty complex. Not necessarily a world that is more uncertain than in the past. I think it would be very hard to establish that the world today was, is more uncertain than, I don't know, 40, 40, 1944 or 1919. Uh, or, uh, but uh, what we argue is that there are novel aspects to the uncertainty that we're confronting. And there are in particular, in particular three novel layers of uncertainty. The first is what we describe as the new reality of the Anthropocene. How many of you have heard the word Anthropocene? A few. So the Anthropocene is what the Earth system scientists and geologists uh, are proposing as something that describes a new planetary reality in ge the geological time scale. It's not formally adopted yet by geologists, but it is under active, active discussion. Uh, and we believe it's a, it's a useful frame because it brings together two very important ideas. First, that what we're confronting is not only something that is manifested in climate change, which has a lot of salience and we recognize its importance, rightly so, or I should say perhaps not enough, but, but certainly there's awareness about climate change. But it's not only climate change. It's what's happening to biodiversity loss. It's what's happening to 
the way in which humans are reshaping the evolution of life on Earth. Just to give you, I mean, there are many indicators that I could give you, but I, one that I find striking uh, is as follows. Today, the weight, if you were to weigh, all the uh, dogs uh, that humans have as pets, their weight would be exactly the same as the weight of all the wild mammals that exist, ter ter terrestrial wild mammals. Think about that. Uh, the mass of humans and livestock bred for human consumption is 17 times larger than the mass of all the wild mammals, including uh, sea mammals. 17. 17. When seven. So it's just a reshaping of, of planetary processes that is driven by human choices, human actions. And again, it's not only climate change, recognize it's important, it's biodiversity loss, the pressures that we're putting on nature, on, on uh, biodiversity, account for, according to many studies, for the increase uh, in the frequency of new or emerging zoonotic diseases. This century alone, we've had one new or emerging zoonotic disease on average every three years, of which COVID-19 may have been the, the latest example. Um, up until a couple of months ago, we had an outbreak of Ebola in Uganda, in Kampala, in the capital city. So it's just a, a series of planetary changes that are happening as a result of human pressures on the planet that are making for a world that is more dangerous for humans and other forms of life. And it's unprecedented. That's why we call it a novel layer of uncertainty. It's unprecedented in human history, and it's even most likely unprecedented even in the geological timescale of our planet, in the 4.5 billion years uh, uh, of our planet. The second layer of uncertainty has to do with something that I don't need to elaborate much upon, with uh, the transformations that are happening around uh, uh, the digital world, uh, and around the efforts to fundamentally change the way in which our societies and our economies organize themselves in terms of the energy systems they rely upon, which is the Industrial Revolution, as we all know, are based on fossil fuels. We want to change that. So these are dramatic transformations uh, uh, that, come, uh, that come filled with opportunity, but also, along with them, provide for a context of social and economic dislocation. And the third layer of uncertainty, which is perhaps not new, and just to backtrack, you know, the second layer, uh, backtrack a bit, the second layer of uncertainty, how, how is it unprecedented? Because there have been many transformations like this in, in history. It's unprecedented at least in a sense that it's being purposefully pursued. We are trying to change our economies and societies in ways that lead to more sustainable patterns of production and consumption. Yes, we had a transition from agriculture to industrial societies, but that was not actively being pursued. It was something that emerged, uh, and it's quite different from the kind of transformations that we're currently pursuing. Third layer of uncertainty has to do with the context of political polarization, social polarization, which I don't think we can argue is new. It has happened in many um, times in history, in many different contexts, but once again is acquiring new contexts and new configurations, and in particular is connected with these uh, perceptions of insecurity. Um, and um, we find uh, two important correlations um, that speak to the, to the novel aspects uh, of, of this uh, uh, context of polarization. One is a correlation between perceptions of insecurity and people being attracted to the extremes of the political spectrum, both on the left and on the right. So what you see on these bar charts are three sets of bars uh, that move from people not feeling insecure to people feeling very insecure. And you see the distribution of the population across the, the spectrum, the political spectrum. So the red bars 
provide for the share of the population that's at attracted to the extremes. And you can see that the height of the red bars increases as you move from people that do not feel insecure to people that feel very high levels of insecurity. So this is the first correlation that's important. People that feel more insecure tend to be attracted to the extremes of the political spectrum, both on the left and on the right. So if you go back to what I said at the very beginning with these perceptions of heightened insecurity, it's no surprise that we see a context of polarization in many parts of the world. The second important correlation is the one that we find between people feeling insecure and people trusting others less. So again, with the context of increasing perceptions of insecurity, it's no surprise that today the level of trust, this is generalized trust, trust in one another, is the lowest on record. Currently, less than one in three people report trusting one another, trusting each other. So in this context, it's no surprise that we see a deterioration of um, democratic uh, norms and practices around the world. Um, things like freedom of expression, for instance, in many societies around the world. Um, and in the limit, these, these tensions, these fragmentations can lead to violent conflict. Even before the war in Ukraine, According to our estimates, 1.2 billion people around the world, 1.2 billion people were being affected by violent conflict. Not only people living in conflict areas or conflict zones, but affected by the many spillovers of violent conflict. From volatility in food and energy prices all the way to forced displacement of people. So we confront a situation in which uh, we share challenges, the challenges of the Anthropocene, and seemingly our societies, both domestically and in the international context, are finding it more difficult to come together to address them. So this is sort of the bad part of the <laughs> bad story of the report, but the report is meant to be hopeful. Uh, one of my colleagues at the UN said that uh, her, her daughter was, was asked to, to read the report for college, and she, she was so depressed, and, and that made me so sad, because the report is not meant to, f to make people uh, feel depressed. It's, it's, it's meant to, to make people feel hopeful and a sense of possibility. So here's how. how. A context of, of uncertainty and settledness is also a context in which it's possible to do things differently, to change reference points about what one considers feasible. And I think the experience that we all live through during COVID-19 provided for several examples as to how this has happened. We saw a number of vaccines that came online in less than a year, not one, but several. And you know about this process much better than I do. But I do remember that when the um, pandemic was declared, uh, reading in, in, in newspapers, in the media, there were references to uh, the length of time for a new vaccine to come to be approved was as, as, as long as 15 years. And yet in less than a year we had multiple vaccines that were available that were dramatically and equally distributed, but at least there was this breakthrough on, on the technology front. We saw governments always have this concern about spending, uh, fiscal discipline, um, we saw dramatic expansions in fiscal spending by fiscal authorities in many countries in the world. The European Union, for the first time, mutualized uh, its, its debt. We saw central banks take unprecedented measures to essentially uh, not allowing any viable firm to close its doors. And then when it comes to social norms, uh, we saw how we changed our behavior almost overnight. Using masks became standard. Uh, some of us are still using masks. Um, uh, social distancing. So there were dramatic changes in, in, in social norms. So these are some illustrations as to how a context of uncertainty and settledness can also provide for uh, uh, 
doing things differently, uh, even things as dramatic uh, as something that was previously considered unfeasible, possible. Now, it's very hard to do so if people feel insecure. It goes back to this idea of perceptions of insecurity. So we argue that it's important to find ways to enable people to feel more secure. And uh, we highlight in particular uh, two aspects. Uh, one that has to do with that spiral that you see on, on the left um, with, um, if you want, policies, more traditional policies, um, uh, and in particular we highlight the importance of what we call the three I's, uh, investment, investment in people, um, innovation, uh, harnessing not only technological innovation in ways that augments what people, humans, can do as opposed to replacing them, but also social innovations, institutional innovations, and insurance. Insurance both on, on the social, on the public side, as well as on the, on the, on the market side. Um, and here I think it's important to give on insurance some, some perspective on, on the challenge uh, um, that extends beyond the countries uh, uh, where you come from. Currently, social insurance accounts for uh, between 20 and 25 uh, percent of uh, the economies of high-income countries, of GDP of high-income countries. So it's a big chunk. Of, of expenditure. Not enough, should probably be more, but it's already a big chunk. If you go to low and middle income countries, this percentage doesn't reach even 5%. So you can imagine how many people around the world feel in this context of uncertainty when they don't have what we take for granted in many of our societies when it comes to social insurance. Now consider market insurance private insurance. Losses that are covered by insurance in high-income countries are about 50%. So if there's a loss, 50% of those losses that are subject to uh, market private insurance are covered. Again, if you go to low and middle income countries, if you get to 5%, that already be a good, an achievement. So you see these huge gaps when it comes to insurance not only in high-income countries, countries with high levels of the HDI, but also spread around many parts of, of the world. So this is the domain of, as I said, more traditional policies of recommendations, but where the report really tries to uh, invite us to think a little bit more um, in a more novel ways, because we face a novel context of uncertainty, is by, by recognizing that if it is true that we need to change our behaviors um, in many ways, from the way in which we conduct ourselves as consumers, from the, what firms decide to produce, what investors decide to put their money in, it's important to recognize that behaviors are determined by incentives, certainly, but also by the social context. And here uh, we think it's important to understand how uh, we can harness social norms to uh, uh, drive people towards more collective choices. So in the end, and I'll, I'll conclude uh, with this, um, we argue that it's important to double down on human development to help us to navigate through these uncertain times. Remember at the very beginning I mentioned that human development has two these key ideas. A broader notion of well-being that goes beyond income, but also the importance of agency. Amartya Sen used to have the expression that we should look at people not as passive beneficiaries of transfers or assistance, but also as agents able to shape their own lives. So if we bear in mind this notion of human development, this would be a way of shaping our future in a world in transformation. Thank you very much.